Hello everyone. Welcome you all to our global platform of knowledge, Movement Maestro Academy. Like every year, we are going to start our free live session series of this year, 2022. Every month throughout the year, we will continue the free learning sessions with our reputed resource persons. Must join and avail the free learning benefits throughout the year with your friends also. Today, we are going to start the first session of this year on the topic Lumbopelvic Biomechanics. For today's session, we have our renowned resource person, Dr. Vanit Kumar Sir, who is working now as an assistant professor at Chandigarh University. Welcome you, sir, and thanks for your valuable time for today's session. Without wasting our time, let's start the most awaited today's first session of this year. Over to you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. So as sir has already introduced me uh, with the discussion topic, which uh, we are going to discuss uh, today, so that is a lumbo pelvic uh, biomechanics. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Sir first for providing me um, such opportunities to share my views on such a beautiful topic. So uh, thank you, Sir. Uh, so coming to today's topic, uh, uh, it is lumbo pelvic biomechanics. You see, uh, this topic it is a very important clinical aspect. And uh, why it is important? Because you see, this is the reason uh, for which uh, number of patients they used to come to us um, with the clinical symptoms, right? So most common it is lower back pain. So to understand the lower back pain, first we need to understand the normal functioning of the lower back. So exactly that is what is the lumbopelvic biomechanics, all right? So starting with the topic, if you see the spinal column. So of course, it is a very complex structure. What is its function inside the body? You see, it provides protection for the spinal cord. And as well as it is also an important structure in providing the mobility and stability of the trunk and the extremities. So it is just like the, uh, what we can say, the base of the body, right? So if you see the wholly and solely the movements are dependent on this, uh, the mobility of the all the segments as well as the extremities of the body it depends on the spinal segments if you see. So um, uh, uh, while assuming any posture, if you see, if, uh, if you want to uh, catch something, if you want to uh, lift something from the floor, so of course we need to use our spine. So usually if you see, uh, the uh, most common problem nowadays, it is of lower back pain. So of course, so just uh, to understand the clinical aspect, first we are going to discuss here the normal mechanics of the lumbopelvic spine so that we can understand that beyond this uh, normal, what are the things which can lead to the symptoms in your lower back? So as I have told you, it is a complex structure. So it is made up of 33 vertebrae and 23 intervertebral discs. So 33 vertebrae, of course, are divided into different, different segments, right? So segments are cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal, right? So sacral and coccygeal, the second, last, and last segment. So these two, if you see, they contains almost... a not almost the exactly nine vertebrae, but are in fused form. And also the sacrococcygeal complex, it is just the, uh, what we can say, the back wall of the pelvis, pelvis, right? So this way, if you see the uh, sacrum and coccygeal, all these are fused, whereas other segments, the cervical, thoracic and lumbar are non-fused one. So uh, in nutshell, if you see the total 33 vertebrae are there. Then an important uh, 
aspect of the spine is to understand the spinal curvature. So, of course, uh, nowadays number of patients we usually see uh, related to the postural abnormalities in the spine. Right. So, um, before thinking of the pathological conditions, we must think of the some postural abnormalities first. Right. So, of course, these are uh, the commonest one. If you see, just uh, particularly target the cervical spine. The upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome. So all these are just the uh, result of the false postures which we assume on the daily basis. So of course there is some role of the curvatures as well. So if you see the spine, it is not like a straight rod. It is not like a straight rod. If you are viewing the spine from the back, it will be like a straight rod. But when you are viewing from the sides, it looks like it is having. Uh, the spine is having the curvatures, right? So curvature means the curves. So there are basically two types of curves mainly. One is kyphotic, another one is lordotic, right? So uh, when the baby takes birth, at that time, the body, it is uh, just in the flexion posture. So uh, flexion posture or otherwise we can say it as kyphotic posture body is in that or the baby uh, after immediately after the time of birth or whenever uh, just before the birth when the uh, um, fetus inside the mother the mother's bomb right so primarily if you see there is kyphotic curves in the body right so what is there in that there is posterior convexity so when you are viewing somebody's back so it will look like the convex so convex and concave all of you must know so what is there? There are two primary curvatures. Uh, there is primary curvatures at two points or two segments, mainly the thoracic and the sacral. Because uh, when uh, before taking birth, if you are talking, the fetus it is in kyphotic or flexion posture. So normally there will be the kyphotic curve. But as the baby starts growing, starts assuming the upright posture, what happens as the result of weight wearing and the different postures, the Curves opposite to that, curves opposite to that, they start appearing. So what, what happens? I was telling you, there is posterior convexity. Then there will be the posterior concavity. So the primary curvatures, primarily, there are kyphotic curvatures. But in adaptation to these primary curvatures, there is development of the secondary curvatures, which are lordotic curvatures so like in our cervical and lumbar spine if you look at the cervical and lumbar we have lordotic curvatures so these are just the adaptations to the kyphotic posture of the body so they develop as a result of the accommodation of the skeleton to the upright posture nothing that so of course there is advantage of these curves now we have uh, uh, seen spine it is made up of different segments so seg segments and segments they contain vertebra Right, it is not like a rigid rod, not like a rigid rod. So, advantages of these curves, if you see, if the vertebral column is curved, like I told you, if it is containing the normal kyphotic and normal um, uh, lordotic curvatures, so the curved spine it has the ability to resist much higher compressive loads. Now, what is happening if you see the weight of the body, it is uh, just if you draw the force vectors, so it is just toward the ground. And from the ground, the ground action forces are coming upwards. So basically there is the axial compression, axial compression. So if the body or if the spine is just like a straight rod, it is not having the curves, then there will be much of the compressing loading. But if the curvatures are there, the curvatures will help the spine in developing this resistance to the compressive loads. Now, this spine with the curves has the ability to resist these compressive loads. What will happen if much of the compressive loads will be there? What will happen? Excessive wear and tear, of course. So excessive wear and tear of the joint, it leads to the degeneration. So that is what we say lumbar or cervical spondylolysis, uh, spondylolysis, of course. So that is the degeneration. So it increases this ability up to 10 folds. 
to resist the compressive forces right so i told you vertebral body now when you talk about the ability to resist this compression it comes from curvatures you see there are two structures which are taking this compression one is the vertebral body which is the main and another one is the intervertebral disc now what happens if this compression uh, if these compressive forces uh, our body if it fails to resist these compressive forces so what will happen they will the continuous compressive forces they will lead to the degeneration of the joints one thing i told you as well as the degeneration of the intervertebral disc as well right so this is just the basic foundation or the basic anatomical introduction of the lumbar or the spinal areas now particularly talking about the lumbar vertebrae if you see the lumbar vertebrae these are the thicker and the larger one thicker and the larger one now the lumbar segment it is the third segment after the cervical and thoracic so it is taking the load of the upper part of the body including the upper extremities including the trunk so what is there if you see the uh, as the individual keep on growing so as a result of continuous weight on this vertebras the lumbar vertebras they become thicker and larger to handle these compressive loads and strong muscle forces clear so this lumbar vertebra there are five lumbar vertebras if you see so we have five lumbar vertebra size i told you these are thicker and larger also if you look at the curvature they basically form the lordotic curve lordotic curve now this lordotic curve i told you curvature what will be if curvature will not be there there will be over compressive forces on the vertebras and on the disc but if there is curvature there will be less so this way this curves they help so th there is a common uh, posture related problem flat back we usually diagnose in our uh, clinic so what is there in that flat back flat back is just a postural abnormality in which there is the uh, what we can say the uh, curvature of the lumbar spine it becomes a flat right or it becomes like a straight line so why why that leads to uh, the symptoms in the lower back this is the reason this is the reason because of the excessive compressive forces right and also if you talk about this particular features of the lumbar vertebras the transverse diameter of the lumbar vertebra it is greater than the anterior diameter so these are just the anatomical features now you see i have placed uh, cervical thoracic and uh, lumbar vertebrae the picture of these three vertebrae in front of you so how these lumbar vertebrae they are different from each other you see these are the largest one these are the largest one the uh, foramina if you see of course there is one vertebral foramina whereas the cervical it contains three foramina so there are certain differentiating features there are certain differentiating features the most important is the shape of the vertebra another one is the the angle of the facet joint the angle of the facet joint and spinous process so these are the differentiating features then similarly i told you like lumbar vertebra if i am telling you lumbar is having five vertebrae the sacrum is also having five vertebrae so you see here in the picture i was telling you the sacrococcygeal sacrococcygeal segment it forms the back wall of the pelvis so it is clearly shown here in the picture you can see but these vertebra are fused sacrum it contains five vertebra but fused so it is considered as one unit coccygeal it contains four vertebra again it is fused so nine vertebrae are fused out of 33 rest other are individual mobile segment contributing for the overall mobility of the body right so the sacrum it is like inverted triangular shape and it forms the posterior wall so this is how our sacrum it looks like when we are viewing it from anterior side and when you are viewing it from the posterior side just below the sacrum what we have is the coccygeal coccygeal it is also called as the tailbone coccyx <clears throat> right 
So this you can see the coccygeal, I told you four vertebrae are there. Of course, these all are fused as well, right? Anteriorly, how they look and posteriorly, you just look at the anatomical features in the picture. Then most important we need to learn is about the lumbar spine ligaments, lumbar spine ligament. So from the anatomical point of view, these ligaments, they also, <coughs> we need to discuss about all these things as well, right? So still now what we have discussed, if you see, we have seen spine divided into various segments. Each segment, it contains uh, different sets of vertebra. Of course, we are talking about lumbar pelvic spine. So lumbar, it contains five vertebra having different anatomical features as compared to other vertebra. And we have sacrum. So lumbo pelvic. So pelvis, if you see, pelvis is just like a ring and the posterior wall of that ring, it is made up of the sacrum and the coccygeus. So in nutshell, if you see the spine, it is attached or it is sitting over the pelvis, sitting over the pelvis. So of course, whenever our spine, it is moving, Whenever our spine, it is moving or the spinal segments are moving, the pelvis, it is also playing some role. At the same time, the pelvis, it is articulating with the hip joint. And if you see the spine, pelvis and hip, they have the kinematic interaction. So that is what we need to understand that how these three segments, they work in normal conditions. Also, when we are talking about the movements of the spine, the ligaments, they are also important part of the spine because they keep the check over the vertebral segment movements, right? So you see, we have different ligaments. So I've shown in the picture, the best one to understand is the lateral view. So just to look at the vertebra, at the anterior side of the vertebra or vertebral body, there is anterior longitudinal ligament. And just at the posterior side of the vertebra, you just look at the picture, it is posterior longitudinal ligament. So two ligaments, these are clear, anterior longitudinal and posterior longitudinal. So posterior longitudinal, it is just in the back or the posterior <coughs> line of the vertebral bodies. Then the posterior longitudinal ligament, after this, we have the ligamentum flebum. So you see, when you talk about the vertebra, so just behind the vertebral body, there is vertebral foramina. So vertebral foramina, if you divide it into anterior and posterior part, so anterior part of the vertebral foramina, it is interconnected by the posterior longitudinal and the posterior part of this vertebral foramina, it is having the continuation of the ligamentum flebum. Right. So these are the three ligaments. Then between the spinous process of each vertebra, we have the connecting interspinous ligament. Just above the spinous processes, we have the supraspinous ligaments. So I don't think so. It is uh, difficult to understand just by the nomenclature of the ligaments. You can easily understand where it is located anatomically. So whenever we are uh, or whenever the spine is moving into extension, toward the back side, the anterior ligaments are becoming tight, right? And whenever my uh, I'm moving my spine in the forward bending or whenever I'm uh, performing the flexion movement at the spine, my posterior ligaments are being stretched. So they are keeping the check over the lumbar spinal movements. And also, if you see the vertebra, they also have the transverse processes. So between each transverse process, we have inter transverse ligament which keeps check over uh, mainly over the rotatory or the side flexion movements of the spine. So this is just an introduction about the ligaments of the lumbar spine. So you can see anterior longitudinal ligament as I already told you it keeps check over the extension. So it limits the extension. Posterior longitudinal ligament it limits the flexion. The ligamentum flebum, of course, it limits the forward flexion. Then supraspinous, forward flexion, interspinous, forward flexion. Then intertransverse, it is just the limiting the contralateral side flexions toward the sides as well as the rotatory components, right? So <clears throat> this is just about the anatomical features. Now coming to the individual motion of the lumbar as well as the sacral as well as the pelvis. So when you talk about the kinematic or the motion analysis, you see spine or the um, spinal column, 
grossly if you see it has the flexion movement it has the extension movement it has the rotation axial rotation to the right and to the left and then we have lateral flexions to the right and to the left so in nutshell it has uh, the spinal column if you see six movements flexion extension side flexion to the right side flexion to the left and the axial rotation to the right and axial rotation to the left right first talking about the kinematics of the lumbar flexion lumbar flexion if you see it is more limited than extension lumbar flexion it is more limited than extension so the motion the maximum motion it occurs at the lumbosacral joint now where is lumbosacral joint we have l1 l2 l3 l4 l5 vertebra after that we have s1 s2 s3 s4 and s5 vertebra so the junction at the l4 and l5 it is contributing mainly in the flexion and extension motion of the lumbar spine so the maximum motion at lumbosacral joint it is contributing for the lumbar flexion so at the same time when an individual flexes his or her spine the anterior tilting and gliding of the superior vertebra occurs right so suppose these are two vertebra and i am bending my bending my spine in the forward direction so what will be there the vertebra my one vertebra just above uh, if you are considering the l5 just you need to look at the l4 so l4 will be performing the anterior tilt as well as the gliding so same l3 will be doing the same motion over the l4 l2 will be doing the same motion over the l3 l1 will be doing the same motion over the l2 so each segment it contributes and grossly the lumbar flexion it occurs so the lumbar flexion it increases the diameter of the intervertebral foramen so this is just an introduction about the kinematics so how we proceed with the motion analysis so flexion if we are flexing the spine it generates the compression force on the anterior side of the disc of course so it will whenever we are bending in the forward direction or when we are flexing the spine the anterior side of the disc it will be compressed of course we are bending toward the anterior side so anterior disc will be compressed and the posterior side will be stretched of course so the annulus or the interdiscal content it will be shifted toward the back side now what is its relevance if you see so whenever a patient is coming to you with the problem diagnosed problem of the pivd so just we need to look at that in which direction this protrusion has occurred so if this protrusion so it is clearly mentioned in the uh, mris and other investigative studies that posterior disc bulge posterior bulge disc bulge in the so and so segment so of course if there is posterior disc bulge and you are recommending the flexion exercises so of course these exercises will gonna cause more harm will gonna cause more harm because one thing is disc is already protruded toward the posterior side another thing is you are doing the flexion exercises then again the disc will be pushed toward the back side so these are the little considerations which we need to keep in mind now um, uh, same way i told you the concept of the flat back or the curvatures so if somebody is having the flat back we need not to consider it as the normal one because we know the outcomes they can be dangerous so it is acceptable that in the acute phase the flat back is not causing the much of the symptoms but in later stages it may lead to degenerative changes because there will be the continuous compressive loading of the spine so these are the small things which we need to keep in mind then next motion we have is the lumbar extension means bending toward the back side so lumbar extension if you see what it will help it will help in increasing the lumbar lordosis so extension exercises are commonly recommended to the patients having the flat back or patients diagnosed with the flat back now during the extension of the spine now what is happening you just look at the picture here there is the posterior tilting of the one vertebra over the other so l1 it will be posteriorly tilted and it will glide posteriorly 
over L2. L2 will glide posteriorly and tilt posteriorly over L3. So just we need to look at the one superior segment. So during the lumbar extension, there is posterior tilting and gliding of the superior vertebra. So lumbar extension, it reduces the diameter of the intervertebral for a minimum. It reduces the diameter of the intervertebral for a minimum. Right? So you just look at the picture here. Now the extension, it is mainly checked by the anterior longitudinal ligament and all. So what will happen as the person bends the spine toward the back side, the disc will have the compression on the posterior side. So anterior side, it will be stretched. But if you look at the picture here, you just look at the purple colored arrow. This is the nucleus pulposus of the disc. Now the content of the disc, it will be shifted toward anterior side. Now, if somebody is having posterior disc bulge, posterior disc bulge, and you are recommending extension exercises. So the exercises, they may work because these exercises are helping in reduction or helping in shifting the content of the disc as well. So this is not only the single consideration. There are a number of other things which we need to look at while recommending the exercises, right? It is not like that. So uh, flexion bias, extension bias, we need to check number of things, but this is just the one thing which I am telling you that how you will decide we, uh, which exercises we shall recommend and which we shall not. So if you just simply look at the biomechanics and if you just look at the movement of the interdiscal content and all these things, so this is the simplest considerations which we need to keep in mind. The next is the lateral flexion. So another motion, it is the lateral flexion to the right or lateral flexion to the left. Now, what happens during this motion, what will happen to kinematics, the superior vertebra, it tilts laterally. Now, during the flexion and extension, the vertebra, it was tilting anteriorly and posteriorly. Now, the vertebra, it will be tilted laterally. Lateral tilt will occur. So, again, we need to look at the one vertebra over the other. So, annulus fibrosis, it is compressed toward the concavity side and stretched toward the convex side. So this is just the kinematic motion of the vertebra during the spinal side flexion. Then we have axial rotation. Axial rotation, if you see, it is the, we can say, uh, of similar to other motion, it is the combined motion of the other side. So when you are rotating a spine, what is happening? The Ipsilateral facet joint, they go for gapping and contralateral facet joint, they go for impaction. So during the rotation to the right and left, suppose we are rotating toward the right side. So the same side facet joint or zygoapophyseal joint, it will go for gapping. So there will be a bit of gap in that. And on the opposite side, there will be the impaction or the compression. Right? So here the example it is given axial rotation to the right between L1 and L2 for instance if you see occurs as left inferior articular facet of L1 approximates and the compresses against left superior articular facet of the L2. This is the same thing which I already told you. Right. So this axial rotation if you see it is just limited because of these facet joints as well facet joints as well and it also restricted by tension created in stretched capsule of the zygoapophyseal joint so of course we have uh, uh, the knowledge of the facet joints as well so facet joint it is the capsular joint so it, it has the ca capsule so this contributes for the limitation of the excitation and there are other various uh, ligaments like intertransfers they also contribute for the keeping check over the axial rotation movement, right? So just this rotatory motion, I explained you. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about the sacrum at the same time, right? So all these are the motions at the lumbar spine. Now, what are the motions at the sacral spine? If you see sacral spine, sacrum, it is articulating with the pelvis or ileum in the pelvis 
pelvis it is also made up of three bones ilium ischium and pubis so ilium it is articulating with sacrum forming the sacroiliac joint so if you talk about the kinematics of this sacrum so there is very slight motion it is available of course one thing is this entire sacrococcygeal complex it is fused so no intervertebral movement but yes we if we are considering it as one unit it is articulating with the ilium so there is very slight motion is available and sacroiliac joints they are linked to the symphysis pubis as well so the sacrum it moves in the anterior and posterior direction just this motion it occurs at the sacroiliac joint and it is also affecting or it is also contributing for the motion around the pubic symphysis right so also mainly if you see the motions there are nutation and counter nutation these are two motions so for how you can understand this motion you just uh, uh, look at these two pictures here right so what is there what is the nutation first nutation when you are talking about just uh, uh, imagine or just uh, you need to keep an eye over the tip of the coccyx just to consider or just to uh, pick any of the landmark right so if you are considering the tip of the coccyx if tip of the coccyx if it is moving toward back side toward back side posterior side so it is nutation and if the tip of the coccyx if it is moving toward the anterior side it will be counter nutation counter nutation simplest way to understand this you just need to look at either you can look at the sacral promontory the top or the topmost part of the sacrum or else you can look at the tip of the coccyx so just you uh, remember here the tip of the coccyx so nutation is when the tip of the coccyx it moves toward the posterior side just to look at the picture here it will help you in understanding the things here so when the coccyx it moves posteriorly in relation to ilium in relation to ilium it is termed as nutation and when the coccyx it moves anteriorly in relation to ilium it it, it is called as counter nutation you just look at the second picture so what is happening because of nutation so all these motions they mainly uh, if you see they help in the uh, labor or pregnancy or at the time of the childbirth how it helps so this nutation what happens because of this the ap diameter of the pelvis it reduces the pelvic brim it reduces whereas the pelvic outlet size it improves so in counter nutation it's vice versa it happens so when the counter nutation is occurring at the uh, this sacroiliac joint the ap diameter of the pelvic brim it is increased but the pelvic outlet size it will be reduced so the vice versa motion it is there so it is just altering the inlet and outlet diameter of the pelvis the motion of the uh, this uh, sacrum or sacroiliac joint so now we have seen the sacrum individually we have seen the motion individually now third part with the pelvis i told you it is the hip which is attached so at the hip we are having the three degrees of freedom so motions are flexion extension side flexion uh, sorry abduction adduction and internal and external rotation so it is not like that the individual isolated segment is working all the segments they work in the coupled fashion so what is the spinal coupling we need to understand this mechanism here the spinal coupling it is the kinematic phenomenon kinematic phenomenon so means the combined movement of the spine pelvis and hip we need to emphasize now in which there is the movement of spine it occurs in one plane associated with automatic movement in the another plane right so most consistent pattern involves an association between the axial rotation and the lateral flexion so at the one time it is not like there that uh, only the one only isolated one joint motion it is happening it is the coupled motion right so with the lateral flexion there is pronounced flexion and slight ipsilateral rotation which occurs and with axial rotation there is lateral flexion in contralateral direction it 
occurs. So this is just in regard to motion. Next is in the regard to joint. So if you talk about all these joints, the most important part we need to understand is the lumbopelvic rhythm. Lumbopelvic rhythm. So as the uh, title depicts, what is lumbopelvic rhythm? If you see, it is just the kinematic relationship between the lumbar spine pelvis and hip joint. So just we need to look at the body movements in the lateral view or in the sagittal plane, right? So you just look at the picture. Whenever the person tries to bend his or her spine, the pelvis, it tilts anteriorly, then hip, you see it is in flexion position, but it is not like that. We need to look at the motion, which is occurring at the first instance then secondly what is happening and at the third phase what is happening so bending forward if you see the lumbar flexion it is followed by the anterior tilt so first it is the lumbar spine which bends or which flexes and it is followed by the tilting of the pelvis and flexion at the hip joint right similarly when a person tries to bring his or her body back or posterior or the backward extension or returns to erect what happens in that first there will be pelvic tilting then hips will follow the motion and then the spine will follow the motion so this is the kinematic interaction or lumbopelvic rhythm so i will repeat the thing when we are bending the spine first it is the spine which will contribute second it will be the pelvis and third it will be the hip but when we come back to erect posture it first it will be the pelvis second it will be the hip and third it will be the spine now spine will act in the last this is the kinematic interaction or the coupled motion of all these three different segments the lumbar spine the pelvis and the hip joint how these all these three they interact right so the first part of the bending forward bending forward it consists of the lumbosacral flexion. I told you the spine, it contributes, which is followed by the anterior tilt of the pelvis at the hip joint, then the hip joint flexion, it occurs, right? Now, grossly, if you see, whenever you are doing the forward bending or whenever an individual is uh, performing the forward flexion, so what happens, the back muscles the back muscles erector spinae and all they eccentrically contract they contract eccentrically right lengthening but they have the tension why because they are controlling the fall of the body or the movement of the body against the gravity right and when we are coming back to the extension or erect posture at that time the erector or the back muscles they contract concentrically so during the forward flexion they eccentrically work and during the erect posture or uh, uh, bringing back the erect posture they contract concentrically so this is how the muscles they also work in this so return to the erect posture this rhythm is reversed so it is initiated by the posterior tilting i told you and at that time hip extensors they initiate the posterior rotation of the pelvis of course so hip extensor means the gluteus maximus and all and after that it is the motion of the hip joint and the spinal vertebra at last right so this is just an introduction toward the lumbopelvic rhythm how all these three segments they work when they work together right so next is the kinetic aspect kinetics means the forces and all which are acting on the spine so one we have seen it is the compression so compression for compressive forces on the spine so lumbar region it provides support for the weight of the upper part of the body so whether you are in static position whether you are in dynamic position so your spine it is continuously having the compressive forces so as a result of that what is there the size of the vertebra in adaptation to compressive load it becomes large right so these are the just ranges which are mentioned here 
you just uh, look at the uh, load at the spine so lumbar sacral load in erect position it is in the uh, range of 0.8 to 1.18 times of the body weight whereas during the walking this load it gets increases right so changes in the position will change the location of the line of gravity of course this change in the force acting on the lumbar pelvic spine so this is how the static as well as the dynamic position of the body it causes alteration in the load bearing capacity of the spine right the percentage of this uh, these forces it can change with the altered mechanics right now with increased extension or lordosis at the spine the zygo apophysial joint will assume more of the compressive load yes this is the mechanical problem which we need to rule out right so the normal biomechanical concept i told you that with the curvature and with the movement or the dynamicity of the body the weight bearing capacity of the vertebra or the forces passing through the vertebra these will be altered but how this will be altered if there is increased extension or exaggerated lordotic curve there will be excessive zygo apophysial uh, joint compression and in later stages there will be the excessive degeneration so also with degeneration of intervertebral disc if you see they will assume increased compressive load right so if the anatomy of the normal spine if it is getting altered also the kinetic and kinematics it will be getting affected which will be leading to the problem or the symptoms in your lower back second is the shear forces of course so the vertebras are gliding over one over uh, another right gliding tilting and all those motions are there so the, the the vertebras they will be under the continuous anterior shear forces which are mainly caused by the lordotic position of the lumbar spine as well as the body weight as well as the ground reaction forces so these are the continuous forces which are most commonly or the continuously occurring on the lumbar spine right so just this is the kinetics or the forces so mainly there are compressive or shear forces which are occurring at the lumbar spine continuously right so this is just an idea so i'm again revising the quick point uh, the uh, common points quickly what we have discussed we have lumbar spine we have sacral we have coccygeal sacral and coccygeal we consider it as one unit lumbar has different set of motions coccygeal and sacral has different set of motion so if you we'll talk about the sacro coccygeal complex the two motions are there nutation and counter nutation i told you what is nutation and what is counter nutation now this nutation and counter nutation and lumbar spine flexion and extension and hip joint flexion and extension how it works together i told you the pattern of the lumbo pelvic rhythm so we need to keep in mind just that so during the flexion which muscles are working concentrically which are working eccentrically one thing another thing is during uh, flexion to extension or assuming the extension position what uh, what is the function or the how the muscles are functioning that we need to see and what is the impact of the curvature that already we have seen what will happen if the curvatures will be increased and what will happen if the curvatures will be reduced right so in in nutshell if you see if there is some problem related to your uh, posture it may lead to degeneration in the later on stages and the worsening of the symptoms right so this is just an idea about the lumbo pelvic biomechanics now we will discuss a bit of the pathomechanical aspects or the commonest pathomechanical problems in the lumbar spine one is exaggerated lordosis right so kyphosis and lordosis these are two normal curvatures in the spine what is the problem when these curvatures they become exaggerated increased that becomes the problem or when these curvature they become reduced normally a normal curvature it is there in the spine and it is required this we have seen in the normal mechanics but if it increases or if it becomes flat it becomes problematic so number one it is exaggerated lordosis if there is abnormal exaggeration of the lumbar spine curvature it is called as exaggerated lordosis what happens in this weakened abdominal muscles tight hip flexors and deep 
lumbar extensor tightness right so in nutshell if you see the if lordotic curvature if it gets changed the tilting of the pelvis it gets changed and it indirectly leads the leads toward the lower cross syndrome lower cross syndrome so as a result there will be the increased compressive stress on the posterior elements and which will predispose to the low back pain so if the curvature it is exaggerated if the curvature it become flat both the problems can lead to the excessive compression and the symptom like low back pain and in the uh, long term effect if you see it will slowly and slowly it will be get turned into the lower cross syndrome next is the sway back sway back now what is sway back it is the increased lordotic curvature and in adaptation to that the kyphotic curvature it also becomes increased right so there is increased lordotic curve and kyphotic curve so what happens as a result of this few structures they become weak and few structures they become tight so the weak structures are lower abdominals lower thoracic extensors and hip flexors whereas the tight structures are hip extensors lower lumbar extensors and upper abdominals now from a physiotherapy point of view those muscles which become weak we need to strengthen them and those muscles which become tight we need to stretch them or we need to um, um, bring back the extensibility of those muscles so first what is important it is the postural analysis so while assessing any case now most common problem it is nowadays somebody is coming uh, to uh, the clinicians with the pain in the cervical area simplest diagnosis it is cervical spondylolisthesis somebody is coming with the lower back pain you are having lumbar sp uh, lumbar spondylolisthesis no it is not like that i am telling you the majority of the problems nowadays as far as i can uh, i used to see they belong to the postural or mechanical category and which can be corrected with the help of the physiotherapist right but what is important the assessment part we need to see then third is the flat back posture now what happens in this the decreased lumbar radiosis you can see in the picture so what happens in this center of gravity it shifts anterior to the lumbar spine and hips so as a result there will be the increased compressive loading then fourth one is the pars intercularis fractures pars intercularis fractures now pars intercularis if you see it is just the area between the superior and inferior facet if you see so it one vertebra it contains the superior facet and same vertebra it will have the inferior facet as well so between the superior and inferior facet there is the weaker zone weaker zone so if this weaker zone is getting fractured because of the excessive compressive loading it will lead to the permanent lower back pain permanent right if not treated properly so this is the commonest problem so you might have heard about this scottish dog appearance and all those things so what it is pars intercularis fractures pars intercularis fractures and why it happens because of the abnormal wear and tear of the spine as you can see here in the picture the yellowest part highlighted part right then spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis lysis means there is simple degeneration lysthesis means after degenerating or after detaching the vertebral segment it has shifted anteriorly so spondylolysthesis if it has shifted posteriorly it is retrolysthesis so all these are the problems which lead to the symptoms or the symptom in the lower back so you can see normally the spine it shall look like this and spondylolysthesis when all the vertebras above the l5 you can see here has shifted anteriorly so it is spondylolisthesis the next condition which is causing the lower back symptom it is the intervertebral disc prolapse now disc prolapse if you see it is not a thing of single day it is not an event of single day it is just the uh, result of the abnormal biomechanics of the spine from past many days right so if there is abnormal loading abnormal curvatures of the spine abnormal posture of the spine so there will be the comp uh, continuous compressive stress over the vertebra 
which will lead to degeneration of the facet joint then intervertebral joint uh, interbody joint collapse and the disc collapse so the disc of course it will burst from the any of the side lateral anterior posterior anterior so this is the pivd another another uh, uh, way of uh, this pivd or uh, another cause for pivd it can be traumatic so if it is non traumatic so most commonly it is the continuous repetitive stress over the spine if it is traumatic of course the trauma will be the cause the next is the lumbar canal stenosis so of course what is a stenosis it is the narrowing of the lumbar canal or the vertebral foramina so one thing it can be congenital by birth the canal is just the congested canal and the spinal cord or the, it becomes suffocated but if it is acquired acquired means the disc is prolapsed and sequestration or the sequestrum or the, uh, the part of the disc it has extended toward the vertebral column so of course it will cause the suffocation to the spinal cord and the condition it is termed as lumbar canal stenosis and the most common clinical presentation you will see in such cases is the intermittent claudication the patients they will say um i'm having lower back pain and when i start walking and then when i walk for few miles uh, the pain or the discomfort it starts appearing and when i take rest the symptoms they disappear so this is the typical feature which is called as intermittent claudication and which is indicating of the lumbar canal stenosis lumbar canal stenosis the next we have is the lumbar facet pathology lumbar facet pathology means the degeneration at of the facet joint now if the joint is degenerated so with the continuous motion it can become subluxated or dislocated so because of that it gets converted into facet joint syndrome and the arthritis of the zygoapophyseal joint which is the uh, we can say the chronic problem of the lower back then we have is the lumbar contusion strain sprain fracture and dislocation so all these things are related to the mechanical low back pain so you see here 75 to 80% of the population they experience low back pain stemming from the mechanical injury to the muscle ligament or the connective issues right uh, that is a uh, so that's all from my side so sir uh, if you can hear me it's over to you thank you sir thank you so much for sharing your valuable time and knowledge as well you can okay, turn off the screen sir thanks a lot again sir as uh, i already introduced with you all that for today's session our resource person was dr vanit kumar sir who was sharing knowledge on lumbar pelvic biomechanics he is a very kind person and always ready to share knowledge with everyone he is working now as an assistant professor at chandigarh university also continuously he is sharing their valuable knowledge with moment master academy for more than one years as an online teaching faculty thank you everyone for joining through for for the session and thank you so much sir throughout the year we will continue free sessions and also lots of advanced training programs and courses in our academy must join our academic groups and keep learning with us again thank you so much sir and all the participants happy republic day to you all